Hello, I'm Lee Burnick, Dean of the Greenspan College of Urban Affairs, and I want to welcome you to another edition of the Urban Report. Uh, in this edition, uh, our first guest is a uh, faculty member here, it's sort of, and is, but more importantly for us, is a fellow at Brookings Institute in Washington, D.C., and she comes out here um, periodically. Uh, Audrey Singer is a senior fellow, is that correct? At the and as a senior fellow, um, you your major area is in immigration, uh, is that right? That's right. Yeah. I work in the metropolitan in the policy metropolitan program, policy area, which is associated with the Brookings Mountain which, West. Right. So we uh, Brookings Institution has an office here at UNLV, and I'm in the metropolitan policy program at Brookings where we study the full range of issues affecting cities and suburbs. Right, and uh, we'll get to one of those things, one of those topics that really does focus in on local governments for us, state and local governments, in a second. So when you come out here, and you've been out here, this is not the first time you've been no, here. No, I've been here several times. You've been here several, what is it that you do when you come out here? So when I come here, I try to learn as much as I can about the region, about Las Vegas as a city, as a, as a region, as a workplace, as um, a place where people live. I explore the neighborhoods. I talk to as many people as I can in a formal way. I have a lot of meetings, but I also do a lot of informal poking around and, and talk to people. Um, my interests are in how places change, and this is certainly a place that's changed tremendously over a very short period of time. So understanding those issues particularly as it relates to immigration, um, is my primary interest okay. here. And so last night, uh, or uh, you, you did a, uh, you gave a talk, which is a typical kind of thing for a Brookings fellow to do when they're out here, and your talk was on immigration and uh, your area of expertise. And let's talk about that, and, and it's particularly important for us here in, in Las Vegas. It is a, an important topic for us. But um, there are a lot of issues surrounding immigration and I'm not sure that everybody fully understands some of those issues, but w one of the issues that I think you talked about was in an area of about the labor force and how immigrants, uh, the, you know, the immigrant population is a significant part of the labor force. And I think we have a slide, if we can bring up the first slide, and, and that shows the changing pattern, if I think, right? Of yeah, so let me just say a few words. We're at a moment in time when um, Congress is talking about Im changing immigration policy. Okay. And one of the main um, pushes is in this moment where we're, we've got slow economic growth, a lot of um, slower job growth than we've had uh, coming out of the recession than we did before. Um, there's a lot of talk about how to change our immigration system to better fit our economic needs and to think more about um, how immigrants are part of our economy. And so to help think about that, I've d been doing some research on where immigrants fit into the labor force okay. and the kinds of things that they do in this country. Okay, well, let me, let me do this. I, I think we have some trouble with the technology as, as good as we are about all these things. Let's talk about, uh, we'll talk about those actual patterns in, in, uh, maybe in our second segment, but let's talk about this big issue of the immigration reform. Uh, I know that you, uh, my understanding, and I've seen some of the things that you've written while you're in D.C. about how this may be the best possible time in a long time. Uh, you've talked about how um, we had immigration reform in 1986, is that right? 86 and 1990, that's the last time we had. It's 1990, so 23 years ago was the last time we had. Uh, major overhaul. Major overhaul. But there is some discussion about having a major overhaul today, uh, this year, in, in this Congress. Um, why do you think this is a good time for this to happen? I think, um, well, it's a good time for this to happen because a lot of the people who are critical to this conversation are actually having the conversation. So for the first time, we're seeing Republicans and Democrats working together in both the House and the Senate to think through what legislation would look like. We've already seen um, a list of principles come out of the Senate, bipartisan group of eight senators worked on that and they're working on legislation. Um, 
we see a similar group in the House, there's a, there's a lot of pressure coming out of the White House as well. So o President Obama has um, been talking about doing this for some time, and with so many people on board right now, it, the time is right. Do you think, let me, uh, w let me ask you, do you think that the Republican, you know, House members, can they really get the, the, the package of, of or the, the right coalition of House members? Or are we going to have a, a, a bill that's really just a small number of Republicans and Democrats? That's a great question. Um, well, let me first say that one of the conditions that is making this such a ripe time is what happened in the last presidential election. And immediately following um, the election, the Republican leaders um, began saying that we, we need, America's changing. We have um, a lot of problems with our immigration system. It's time to start doing something. So there's a lot of leadership that uh, is, is pushing. Um, but what you have pointed out is that uh, you know, a lot of representatives go home and hear from their constituents, and um, there's pressure coming from that direction as well. So, uh, yes, I mean, and I think that's the real question, and maybe one of the things we'll get to in our next segment, but it is an interesting question about whether the leadership can get the rest of the, the caucus, especially the Republican. I don't think we have a problem with the Democratic caucus, do we? Nothing like what we have. Nothing like, and, and we don't have as much of a problem in the Senate as we do in the House, is that? That's fair to say, probably. But I, I mean, honestly, for the, f the last time Congress tried to reform U.S. immigration laws was in 2007. And um, the discussions were, were deep and, and um, intense and contentious at a lot of the time. And um, at this point, it's, you know, it's just getting started. So I think as things happen, as we see the discussions continue, we'll, I, I think I could come back and answer that question a little okay. better. All right, so let's take a break. Uh, we're going to take a break right now for this uh, segment, and we'll come back and talk to Audrey some more about immigration uh, in the United States. For others, it may have just been a summer job. But for me, it was training. Now I'm an Air Force pararescue man, and my job is to save lives. Make the right choices today, and be ready for the challenges tomorrow. This message is brought to you by the U.S. Air Force. every hazard out here today? Think again. The spot you missed could be a killer. That spot on your skin could be skin cancer. Fact is, if you're a man over 50, you're in a group most likely to develop skin cancer, including melanoma, the kind that kills one person every hour. One in five Americans is likely to develop a form of skin cancer during their lifetime. That's why your best shot is to check for a spot. It's easy. Follow through and check your skin. It could be the save of a lifetime. Go to spotskincancer.org to find out how. A message from the American Academy of Dermatology. Winston! Just one more inning, Grandma! Ever notice how many things today kids can do without actually moving? A whole lot of things their parents used to do the hard way. So many kids' activities today seem to leave out the activity part, which makes exercise even more important for children. In fact, new research tells us the best time to enhance bone development is during childhood and adolescence. And just getting children to walk an extra 35 minutes a day could spare them the pain of thinning bones later in life. Healthy bones come from healthy habits. Encourage your kids to get up, get out, and get moving. Hello. Hey, Grandma, how about another grape soda? A public service message on building strong bones for kids from the Pediatric Orthopedic Society of North America and the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons. 
Welcome back to this edition of the Urban Report. And we're here talking to Audrey Singer about uh, immigration and the possibilities of immigration reform and some of the issues around immigration reform. And uh, one of the areas that uh, seems to uh, be an important part of the discussion about immigration, and that's verification of uh, workers. And uh, that may be part of the new law, right? Any new law is going to have to have some kind of uh, system to electronically or somehow say to allow employers to, to check, check the status and that we would somehow have a penalty against employers who are uh, hiring people who are not here That's legitimately right. is that That's right. And so the focus is on in some ways the workforce and um, we have a chart uh, if we can bring up the first chart um, one of the things that you see in this chart is that the line is going up, and can you, can you talk about right. that? Right, so this is a very simple graph that shows the share of immigrants in the total population and the share of, uh, of the labor force that immigrants make up. And it starts in 1970, which was one of the lowest points in immigration in this country. Immigrants made up less than 5% of the total population and about 5% of the labor force. And you can see the as the line goes up, um, over the next several decades to, to 2010, um, the, the rising uh, share in the labor force rises faster than the share in the total population. Right. So now we're up to somewhere in, in the teens. Right. We've got about 16% of the labor force mm -hmm. are immigrants and about 13% of the labor force okay. immigrants. And, and when we say immigrants, now we're, we're talking both about legal and illegal? We are talking about how they're measured in um, government surveys. So okay. I use um, census data here. The question is about birthplace. That's all we know. Okay. We know whether they've become a US citizen. So it includes people who are here on green cards, people who have naturalized, people who are here temporarily on okay. business visas, work visas. Well, we don't visas, know about the, obviously students. we don't know about the illegal. Well, they're included in there to the extent that they've been included in the survey. And you know, there are a range of estimates about, uh, the best ones say about half are included in okay. these surveys. Well, that's okay. Um, one of the things that we see is that they're a larger percentage now. They've gone where it was close. Now they are actually uh, overrepresented in that's the right. workforce. And I think there's a interesting chart. If we can bring up the second chart and we have it up there. One of the reasons that we are overrepresented is that immigrants come here to work. They so they're in the prime working ages. And on this graph, which is a population pyramid that shows both the native born and the foreign born populations, you can see that um, a smaller amount of, of the native born population are in the prime working ages, 57%, whereas 79% of immigrants are in the 20 to 64 right. age range. So uh, there's one other thing I have to say about that chart, though. You notice that the, the share of children who are immigrants is very small in those age categories. And that's because most of the children of immigrants were born in the U.S., so they're U.S. citizens. And they're included on the native-born side of okay. that Okay. Well, that's an important thing, and, and that is a concern for some people who don't like the whole idea of discussion of immigration. That's right. Is but the, that there are some very good projections out there that have been done by the Pew Hispanic Center that show that um, over the next couple of decades, virtually all of the growth in our labor force will come from immigrants and their children. Okay. So all of the labor force, we think, the growth, growth in the labor, the force, in the labor force, force is going to be, a, we need that. I mean, frankly, uh, I need we're that. Aging. Right? We're that, aging. That graph shows how rapidly we're aging. The baby boomers just started to turn 65. There's 79 million of them. They're about to come through, and this country is about to get very old over the next decade. And and so two. we need this population. Can we bring up the third slide, which talks about what the labor force is doing? Isn't that right? Right. So I looked at immigrants in certain industries, uh, well, in all the industries in the U.S., and I focused on four that um, employ mostly lower skilled workers and four higher skilled workers. And, and, and on this graph, you, you've got them, and there's this orange line right, which says... Right, the orange line is the 16% the or so that represents the total share in the labor force that are immigrants. Um, the green arrows show the lower skilled industries that I focused on, accommodation, food services, agriculture, and construction. S many of these are really important industries for this region in particular, uh, just by coincidence. 
Um, and then the four higher skilled are high tech manufacturing, information technology, life sciences, and healthcare. Healthcare actually comes in a little bit below that 16% line, but it has the largest number of immigrant workers in mm -hmm. that. And altogether, in those eight industries, 37% of all workers are foreign born. Okay. Let me do this. You talk about these different skill levels. We have a map that sort of demonstrates where people are going, if I'm not mistaken, or where, what parts of the country we have in terms of the immigrants and the labor Their force. And, and I think we have that up right. there now. So the, this was a study I did with uh, Matthew Hall, who's at Cornell University now. And we looked at the 100 largest metropolitan areas. We looked at the labor force, the immigrant labor force in each of them. And we um, assigned skill levels to everyone in that, um, in each metro. And we made a ratio of high to low skilled immigrants, immigrant workers. So you see in this map, the blue triangles represent metropolitan areas that are dominated by higher skilled immigrants. And the red tri uh, downward facing triangles are dominated by lower skilled immigrants and the green circles are a more balanced right. mix. Well, we, don't, we, we only have a few seconds here. Uh, this is just a fascinating uh, discussion. Um, what is important for us in the Southwest is that many of those in the Southwest immigrants are in the low skilled. Isn't that what the map shows? And that's, that's right. That's one of the issues that's for right. us is that we have low skilled immigrant workers. That's right. Okay. They're we have to take a break and uh, thank you and we'll see you in a few minutes on the Urban Report. If you could see anything in the world, what would it be? I'd love to see Paris. I like to see cupcakes falling from the sky. My daughter, married and happy. I want to see things the way I used to. Chances are, someone you love may one day be affected by macular degeneration or glaucoma. Log on to seeabettertomorrow.org or call 1-800-437-2423 to learn about glaucoma and macular degeneration. Call 1-800-437-2423 or log on to seeabettertomorrow.org. I just want to see more of the things I love. I remember the moment. I'll never forget that moment. That moment? It was a moment that changed my life. I'd been training with my team for months. And now, we had been called up for the first time. The real deal. Wildfires were getting dangerously close to home. At that moment, I got my first taste of just how important the Guard is to my community. See how the Guard can be an important part of your life at NationalGuard.com. At what age is the color that your skin was meant to be no longer beautiful? Every year, millions of young women try to change the skin they were born with and say they die for darker skin. Sadly, some actually do. Melanoma is the second most common cancer in teens and young adults, and one person dies from melanoma every hour. Change your thinking, not your skin. Stop tanning. Learn more at spotskincancer.org. A message from the American Academy of Dermatology. Something's not right. My first symptoms were... Constant tingling in my toes. My legs, sometimes I'll go numb. I had double vision. They said you have multiple sclerosis. Well, the beginning is the hardest time. Kind of had to get a grasp on reality. I had to adapt and change very rapidly. I had to learn how to drive with my hands. Yeah, that was interesting. I was a dancer. I don't see walking the way I walk any different than doing a dance. It just looks different. It's a different dance. You see me have an off day, it doesn't take away from who I am. A symptom may cause you not to be able to do that anymore. And at one point, I wasn't able to do any of those. But I would exercise every day. Since I've been cycling, it's definitely helped my walking. To make a lot of changes in my life and just adapt to it. I'm going to acknowledge its presence. I'm not going to discount it. But at the same time, I'm going to try my best to not let it stop me. It's a fantastic opportunity to be working together with a common goal of carrying MS. And sharing is the key. Welcome back to another uh, segment of this edition of the Urban Report. And in this segment, I have a uh, colleague of mine, 
from the Greensburg College of Urban Affairs and uh, Bill Sousa. Bill is a uh, professor in uh, criminal justice and uh, received his PhD at Rutgers, if I'm not mistaken. Right. And mm -hmm. uh, he is involved in the local community, uh, does a, a lot of work with the uh, Metro mm -hmm. and talks about violence in uh, Las Vegas and how we can reduce the violence in Las Vegas. Um, I want to welcome you to this, Thank to you. the Urban Report. Um, in not too long ago, we, we had, uh, we, we unfortunately gained a great deal of national notoriety by having um, a shooting on the Strip mm -hmm. uh, where several people were killed and uh, people across the country saw this. And the question is, is this something that's pretty standard for us? Uh, how does this fit in? Are we a really violent uh, community? Uh, what can you tell us about this? Right. Well, uh, uh, fortunately, uh, uh, situations like what occurred uh, a week ago are very, very rare uh, here in Las Vegas. Um, clearly, when something happens in, in a very public place, uh, people feel that, um, you know, this is somewhere where I could have been. Uh, and um, so surely when you have uh, this type of event that occurs in a public place, especially someplace as public as the Strip, uh, there's a cause for concern. Uh, but it, it is a very rare event. Uh, and um, Las Vegas, uh, crime occurs in all cities. Uh, all large cities have some problem related to uh, crime and violence. Uh, Las Vegas, however, overall is, uh, is a relatively safe place. If you look at uh, other cities across the nation, um, our uh, crime uh, is, is uh, uh, not, not as bad as, as many uh, communities face. Uh, often Las Vegas um, uh, gets a, a bad rap um, because when uh, uh, national statistics are produced, uh, the crime rate in Las Vegas um, uh, ranks rel relatively high. Uh, but part of the difficulty with these statistics is that um, most of the time the crime rates are calculated uh, based on residential population. Uh, and this really does a disservice to places like Las Vegas and, and other places that have a large tourist population, such as Orlando and even Reno, uh, because if you calculate in the tourist into the, that population, then our violence rate and crime rate would drop uh, quite dramatically. Uh, so overall, Las Vegas, Las Vegas is a very uh, safe place in general. Of course, crime does occur uh, and don't want to give people the impression that it doesn't. Um, crime does occur, but overall we have a relatively safe city. Um, you talked about the base and, and talking then about tourism. Y you're not arguing that the tourists are the ones that are <laughs> that are causing the crime here. That's right. right? No, not, not at all. Uh, um, the Strip uh, overall is extremely safe. Um, events like that uh, are, are very, very rare. Um, uh, but tourists are often the victims uh, of crime, um, uh, and uh, so, so crime does occur, uh, but um, often it's not the, the tourists who are, who are coming in to, 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 uh, to, to do bad things. But, but we just have more opportunities in terms of with the tourists. Is that what you're saying? Yet? Sure. Uh, tourists, you know, when you come here, you're having a good time. Uh, your, your, your mind is on other things. It's not um, on uh, paying attention to your belongings. It's not paying attention to things that are going around. Uh, and unfortunately, there are people who take advantage uh, of those who are vulnerable in such a way. Uh, and so it's not unusual to have uh, uh, tourists who, who are mostly property uh, a crime and, and these types of things. Um, but I also want to separate, you know, you know, crime in the city. You have what goes on in the Strip and to, to an extent what goes on in Fremont Street. And then you have uh, what goes on in the neighborhoods as well. Uh, and um, most of the people who, who live in Las Vegas, they sort of separate themselves, their communities and where they live from the Strip and what goes on uh, in, uh, on the Strip. Uh, and people uh, are, uh, crime, uh, much like politics, is a local phenomenon. Uh, and so um, people uh, are, are often very concerned with what goes on in their own communities. Okay. Um, well, let me, let me just, you mentioned something about the crime on the Strip and, and, and about violence. And, and so we, should, we could distinguish between the kinds of crime that's on the Strip. The one that we saw a few uh, at some point in the past is a violent one. But mm -hmm. most of the crime isn't. 
violent, right? Not it, at when all. You, you talked about it being property. What do you mean by property crime? Uh, property crime, uh, purse snatchings, uh, you know, uh, ha people ha leaving uh, backpacks or, or shopping bags laying around and then having those, those types, types of things disappear. Uh, you, you certainly have that type of uh, that activity. Uh, sometimes uh, uh, burglaries from uh, uh, autos that, are, that occur in, in some of the parking structures or in some of the parking lots, uh, mostly property offenses. And there's also a fair amount of minor offenses that go on um, on, on the, uh, the strip as well. Uh, uh, you know, um, not so much criminal in nature, but a lot of uh, s some disorderly type of activities. Uh, we have uh, the, the hand billers, uh, people who are passing out, um, you know, uh, material for escort services and, and these types of things. Right. But we also have just a lot of people drinking. A, a lot of public intoxication, uh, and these types of things. Now, do what's they interesting. Keep records? Do they keep records on, on, on the public intoxication uh, arrest? No, or uh, we don't arrest people? Who well, are. yeah, you have to do something other than, than uh, usually there's some, you're doing something else other than just simply uh, drinking um, for, the, for the, to raise that level. Um, but what's so interesting about uh, the Strip is that you do have a fair amount of disorder that goes on in the Strip, but for the most part, people don't really notice it. And part of it is because you have, uh, there's so much life on the Strip that um, the disorder can be absorbed by a lot of the life that goes on. Uh, if you take that same level of disorder and you put it in a residential community, all of a sudden you have a major problem. Uh, you, know, that the, you know, the number of panhandlers, the number of uh, uh, people who are intoxicated. In a residential community, that, uh, that could spell disaster for that community. On the Strip, there's so much life that it can absorb a lot of that. Okay. Uh, yeah. Well, we're almost done, yeah. and, and so, but I do want to thank you, and we'll, we'll have you back, because I want to talk about off, outside the Strip. Mm -hmm. there's, uh, we want to let people know that it may be, uh, not maybe, it is safe. Mm -hmm. uh, again, I want to thank you for coming in today, here. and I want to thank you for watching this edition of the Urban Report. Uh, if you have questions or concerns, you can always contact us at UNLV at the Greenspan College of Urban Affairs. And again, thank you for watching the Urban Report.